please welcome to the stage Nancy Gibbs, Nabia Syed, and Martha Minow. Good afternoon, folks. Empty coffee cups, full bladders, but you're still here. Um, if you are at all interested in how our information ecosystem has become what it is, then you are going to love the next 30 minutes of your life. I am so thrilled to be here with two of my personal heroes. On my left, I have Nancy Gibbs, who is the director of the Shorenstein Center and the Edward Murrow Professor of Practice here at Harvard. And on my right, I have Martha Minow, who's the 300 year anniversary professor at Harvard Law School, also former dean, which means that we have the perspective of what's been happening with media, what's been happening in the law, converging in the thing that we call our information ecosystem. I don't know about you, but I don't look at our information ecosystem and think that it's working perfectly. I think that I have notes, I have comments. But just to set the table a little bit, when we think about our information ecosystem, we're talking about where we get information, where we come across expertise, where we get context for what's happening in the world. And for many, many years, journalism, media institutions were the ones that were the gatekeepers for a lot of that, right? They were the ones who'd surface information, who would surface context. They weren't the only ones, but they really captured our attention in doing that. The promise of the internet, sort of the question that Jay-Z began the day with, the thing that made people excited, was that there were gatekeepers who had emerged in doing that kind of work. And what the internet provided was an opportunity to remove some of those gatekeepers, right? Get perspectives of people who had not had a seat at the table to provide more information, more context, more expertise. And that seemed great. That's when I came online and I was very excited about it. But here I am in 2023, and I think, uh, that dream is maybe a little bit of a nightmare sometimes. So Nancy, I wanna to turn to you and talk about sort of the role of these historical gatekeepers of the folks in the, of the sort of the, the media and what's happening with journalism. We've talked a lot about news deserts, right? About how so many are underserved in their information needs. At the markup, also hi, I'm Nabi Hasseid, I'm the CEO of the markup. I didn't introduce <laughs> myself. I was too excited to be here with them. Um, we talk about news mirages, areas online that look like you're getting information, but it's not verified. It hasn't gone through any of the standards and processes we'd appreciate in journalism. And so I'd love it if you could just talk to us a little bit, frame for us how technology sort of radically changed the media, not social media, we'll get there, the media space. Well, if you, if you start with the idea that however imperfectly the press, traditionally defined, um, had a constitutionally protected role for a reason, which was a belief that some sort of independent accountability function was essential for a free society. And however imperfectly that role was performed, I think that was a very important idea. And however um, narrow and, and unrepresentative those gatekeepers were, we saw, especially through the 20th century, the development of standards and rigor and practices and ethics around performing that role, um, which the arrival and the power of the platforms made dramatically harder. And I would say for three main reasons. One, as Larry pointed to, they completely blew up the business model. And it wasn't just that eyeballs started moving from print newspapers and magazines to digital. It was that advertising moved not from print to digital so much as print to just the platforms. So that fairly quickly, just Google and Facebook were soaking up about two thirds or more of the advertising dollars. And every news organization of any kind was left to divide up the rest. That meant a lot of things. For one thing, performing that basic accountability function costs money. It takes resources. It takes boots on the ground who are going out and reporting the stories and finding things out. You know what costs a lot less than doing that? Having an opinion. And so there were many reasons why, even as opinion, uh, 
tended to drive a lot of subscriptions and engagement, which was profitable. It was also cheaper than the hardcore news reporting, especially in the places we need it most, especially in war zones, which is dangerous and expensive and hard to do. And you know what? Audiences aren't often as interested. So you have all these downsides that go with the important public interest focused kind of information creation against the cheaper, easier, more engagement driving. And so to the extent that these trends, you know, some of these reflect human nature and what people care about, but the fact that resources were drained away from that core function that is the reason the independent press was protected in the first place. The platforms had a lot to do with that. And then, of course, the larger context of that is the extent to which they drove an attention economy. I mean, those gatekeepers had the luxury, if you were the anchor of the CBS Evening News or the editor of Time Magazine or the New York Times, Time competed with Newsweek, the New York Times competed with the Washington Post, CBS competed with NBC and ABC. Pretty easy field of competition. You were not competing, not just with thousands of networks and Netflix and the streamers and Fortnite and video games and every single influencer and creator on TikTok. So, so even if you were willing to spend the money to do the work, to gather the information, to serve the public interest, good luck getting people to pay attention to you when you had so many other alternatives. So th there are so many things we could talk about, but to me, those are some of the core ways that even news organizations that continue to this day to try mightily to perform that essential public interest role are facing headwinds that the platforms have a huge hand in providing. Wonderfully optimistic. I wanna take us to another time in history where there was a cacophony of, of voices, right? And that is, we, we imagine this golden era of media, right? This golden era of this institutional journalism where it is the Time Magazine, the ABCs, like the big networks. But there was a noisy time before that too, and I would love to bring you in, Martha, and hear a little bit about how government policy sort of helped build the media that we revere and respect and feel that we are losing what role did government policy play in sort of creating that era of golden journalism? Well, thanks so much, and probably it was never gold, but it was better than now. Uh, you know, the, the founding fathers of the United States believed that the press was essential. Uh, uh, it's the only private industry mentioned in the Constitution and is treated as if it existed, because it did exist. It is a private industry. It has been a private industry. Throughout the 19th century, it went through many changes. There was a period when the political parties were the major funders of uh, major newspapers. So uh, there was also a period of what we call yellow journalism, where it was basically about scandal. It really wasn't so different than what some people are critical right now. But the consolidation of uh, certainly national media, but even uh, in, in regional and local, occurred with the rise of technologies. And the technologies of telegraph first, then radio, then television, uh, really provided a predicate for government policy. Government policy to regulate scarcity, the scarce access to the airwaves, and in so doing, Actually, the United States government believed that there was a public interest duty for anyone who received a license. That was true for broadcasting. It actually carried over to some degree even with cable when scarcity was no longer the same uh, problem. But government also has shaped uh, the uh, entire industry with the uh, use of antitrust policy. Uh, with the uh, where is competition required, where not, changing rules about whether the same owner can own uh, the, te the television and the newspaper, different periods of time, different attitudes about that. Government is all over it. Government also has been a major funder in the development context. Government, after all, paid for the development of the algorithm behind the internet. Uh, government paid for uh, the development of public media, public broadcasting. Government creates uh, the tax code that has enormous impact on this entire industry. So the government's fingerprints are all over this situation. 
I think it's so powerful to remember the government can set those incentives and not only think of regulation as something that can whack-a-mole the bad things. So we live in a time where we observe a lot of harms online and the impulse has been to say, well, we need to regulate misinformation. We have to do something about this. And I, I wonder, and this is for both of you, but I'll start with Martha, about how carefully we should tread when we are entering into a realm of someone should do something about that uh, with the law. And I'd love some context, too, about what's live right now with talks about jawboning and some of the cases in front of the Supreme Court. So the United States is on the extreme end of the entire planet and all of history with a protection of freedom of speech against government action, notably against government action, not against private party-like platform action. But with that attitude, we should tread not only carefully, we have a Supreme Court that is completely embracing the most extreme version of the extreme version of a libertarian First Amendment. That said, the traditional activities of the government in, for example, antitrust policy, the Supreme Court has upheld the use of antitrust. Uh, the Supreme Court has actually also uh, supported uh, the free speech rights of the private editor, of the private moderator. So there are lots of ro roles for the government to actually reinforce a much more positive ecosystem. You know, I, I can't help but remember that when there was a violent video game case before the Supreme Court, there was only one justice who'd ever seen a violent a, a video game, period. Um, I think that there are more justices now who have some knowledge of technology, but these are not experts. Um, and they're, they've been ducking cases, we'll see, because I can't quite duck the cases that are now before the court between coming from Florida and Texas efforts to uh, have content regulation. I personally think it'd be much more successful for government to go the antitrust way. Why not? Why not require that there's competition on the moderating function? Why, where is it written? that this is uh, bundled content, bundled activities that do not violate the antitrust laws. Looks to me like it violates the antitrust law. If there was competition around that, that's something government could enforce that would make a difference. Um, I also would advocate for treading carefully, but it's also around, as, as concerned as I am around mis and disinformation, as serious as problem it is, in our context of First Amendment concerns, that in some ways the content that I'm also really concerned about when it comes to the health of democracy doesn't have to do so much with mis and disinformation, but the platforms play a really critical role. And that is the extent to which I think they distort our understanding of the state of debate in this country. We know that something like 87% of people who identify as sort of center right and 77% of people who identify as center left say they never post about politics and public issues online. Like the middle of our, of our public sentiment space just don't want to be in this conversation online. And the result is that the, the people who are talking and posting and tweeting and, uh, and what we see and hear and what shapes our sense of the state of our political discourse is wildly distorted by more extreme views. So we end up thinking the country may be more divided than it actually is, that our political opponents are more extreme than they actually are. And you know, when Larry talks about uh, our need to learn how to talk to each other again, like in order for us to succeed at anything, to solve any problem, to address any of these issues, people have to feel like it's okay to express their values, their point of view, their starting point. Someone can disagree with them, you can have an argument, and it's not gonna destroy you personally or professionally. And in an environment where it is so easy to destroy people personally and professionally for an argument they make, are we really surprised why people might be reluctant to engage in any of these conversations? And why even our technologists who have left private companies are reluctant to speak out about content moderation practices or trust, trust and safety issues because they don't wanna come under the crosshairs too. And so that 
I'm really, I'm concerned about censorship, I'm concerned about self-censorship, and I'm concerned about the way this environment we're operating in gives people lots of reasons to self-censor. I wanna stick with that, because I think there's something really important to underscore there, which is we so often look to social media as something as, oh, this is causing the harm, this is causing the ills, but in what ways is it like any technology, a reflection of the society that we're in and other mechanisms, other spaces in which we might be bonding with one another and having that sort of connective tissue isn't happening and it's too noisy online to really figure that out. And, and I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you on to what extent are we trying to pin this problem on social media when it's a much larger cultural one? I, I think it's hard to separate online experience and offline experience in these ways, but to pick up a topic that is near and dear to Martha's heart, the, the news organizations that were hardest hit economically by the rise of the platforms are local news organizations. And as it happens, they are the most trusted, so we can least afford to lose those. And they are most missing if you sort of look at the maps of news deserts and the maps of where political power is concentrated in this country, it's the same places. Like you all know, because you're students of how the Electoral College works and how the Senate works, that a voter in South Dakota is way more powerful than a voter in California by orders of magnitude. And yet that voter in South Dakota is also much less likely to have reliable access to relevant local information. And so this is where I feel like if we don't at least start with rebuilding our local news ecology, I don't see how we work up to a healthier, broader public square. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And if you don't have local news, we have pretty good research that shows private corruption goes up, government corruption goes up, accountability goes down, voting goes down. So uh, I, for me, this is uh, top of mind, how to rebuild local news. Um, so I'm the chair of the MacArthur Foundation, which is a part of a coalition of 21 uh, foundations and philanthropists that are trying to invest. We've committed half a billion dollars to rebuild local news. But in addition, I'm interested in initiatives like at MIT, the Center for Constructive Communication, which is bringing people together initially in public libraries, but also using technology to allow people to hear trusted conversations from people that they don't encounter in their daily lives. I mean, I think that the, Nancy made such an important point, the narrative that we have that we are polarized is self-determining, it's self, fulfilling when in fact most people don't like what's going on and most people want rather similar things. They want decency and opportunities for their families. So I think that if we could have more of the face-to-face -face, uh, conversations as well as more uh, uh, bedrocks in local communities and regional communities and build back trust, I think that would be, uh, well, in my view, that's the most important thing to be working on. Related to that, sort of creating those spaces of us speaking to one another, I want to pick up a thread from the earlier, I think the first panel, about this desire to have sort of different forms of content moderation, the different ability to engage with platform in different ways. And while there's some part of me that's very interested in give, you know, devolving that kind of control about your experience, I do wonder how about how that might challenge our ability to have shared realities with one another. The useful role of the news, whether you liked it or not, is that it generated consensus around what the parameters of debate were for something, um, about what was actually happening in the world. And it's not clear that anyone's really stepped in to, in a centralized way, have that role. We have small pockets uh, of shared realities rather than consensus, and um, we have, a minute and a half left, so I asked you a big question for that, but I, I wonder about how you, especially as we're heading into 2024, what is the role of technology in helping us create that shared reality? What is the other work that we should be doing to create that? Well, the problem is larger than the technology. We have rival m media companies that use even old-fashioned distribution systems um, that tell completely different stories about what matters and about even if it's cover the same things, 
different versions. And this is before we have the deep fakes that were discussed in the last panel. I think that trust actually uh, is not something you can uh, accomplish with a magic wand. You have to earn trust and uh, building trust with trusted navigators uh, is gonna be, I think, the only way that we will make it through. How, how, who are those navigators? I don't know, but it's, uh, I wouldn't look to the government, actually, as the navigators. We actually are launching a new research initiative at Shorenstein around news influencers in the belief that we have to look beyond who considers themselves a journalist to who is actually performing the essential functions of journalists, whether they identify as journalists or not. And, and what is fascinating is if you, if you ask people whose primary news source is uh, TikTok, Snapchat, or Instagram, they trust individual influ influencers on those platforms more than they trust news brands. It's not true on Facebook and Twitter where you know, news and institutions are trusted more, but on the platforms that younger viewers are tending to use, the trust relationship is with individuals. And so we're, what I wanna study is not just engaging with influencers around sort of journalistic best practices around rigor and fact checking. It's for journalists to learn from influencers about building trust, about building audience, about the connection that they are making. Because I think addressing these problems is going to take real humility and curiosity and a willingness to expand our definitions of who we're engaging with and, and who constitutes the, the various entities of this ecosystem uh, far beyond what we might have traditionally thought of. Trust feels like the right way to end a day of fascinating discussion and to applaud the launch of a new lab, which is very exciting, that will help us navigate how we trust institutions, how we trust the technologies that mediate so much of our life, and how we ultimately trust one another. So thank you, everyone, for a wonderful day and a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage faculty co-director of the Applied Social Media Lab, Professor James Mickens. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, let's just give one more final round of applause to all our distinguished guests and the great conversations that they set up. Also, I want to give a special shout out to the president who couldn't make it here. We hope that he feels better. And by the way, in a very nice gesture, he actually uh, called the green room before, a couple minutes before this event was to start. And he got on speakerphone, and in a very nice gesture, he you know, said he's sorry that he couldn't show up here. So we, we do hope that he feels better. Um, now, by the way, in that call, the only two things that I said were, hello, Mr. President, and feel better soon. But in just having a speaker phone call with President Obama, hundreds of my relatives can now go directly to heaven, okay? There's nothing that I will ever personally do that will surpass that, I believe, in my lifetime, uh, except possibly run for political office. President Obama, did you hear something special in me during that speaker phone call? Did you see a hint of leadership? Let's form a coalition of two. Okay, have your people call my people. I don't have any people, okay? I can maybe borrow some of your people, okay? That's how you get people. You wanna get in in this building at the ground level, it can only go up or stay the same because I don't have people. But anyways, uh, I obviously digress. So I hope that, um, like me, you came away from this event um, feeling both sort of a sense of optimism but also a sense of grounding in the challenges that we're going to face. So we heard about a lot of the problems that technology uh, can cause for society. We heard about how misinformation can uh, corrupt our, dis, uh, our democracy. We heard about what happens when social media companies like Twitter cut off API access to great tools like Block Party that help to uh, safeguard uh, vulnerable users online. Um, we also heard about some very uh, positive optimistic things. So we heard about, for example, from uh, Larry Lezik about how we can actually use technology to create uh, online deliberations that strengthen democracy and that bring people together instead of 
uh, pulling them apart. So, like I said, I came out of this with a, a renewed sense of cautious optimism. I hope that you feel the same way. I hope that what we've seen today is that technologists don't always have to just be the problem. They can actually be part of the solution. And that if they work with other people, if they work with other users, if they think and reflect about what they're building, then we can actually start to build technology that actually serves the public good. And I'm gonna take that message to Michigan, to Ohio, to Pennsylvania, okay? Coalition of Two, you were here when it started, okay? Um, so before we conclude, I want to um, offer thanks to Project Liberty, who provided some generous uh, funding for the lab as we're starting to ramp up. We look forward to working with Project Liberty and uh, other partners in academia and industry uh, and out in the world to work on this uh, difficult but, uh, but important challenge of creating technology that works um, for the social good. I also would be remiss if I did not mention the new website that the lab has set up. Let me read from here to make sure that I get the URL right. The URL is https colon forward slash forward slash asml.cyber.harvard.edu. As we can tell, only the best and fullest URLs for these amazing people in the audience. Um, so we've just launched the website. Um, there's not a lot up there right now because we're still in the process of spinning up, but over the next couple weeks, as we start to ramp up, as we start to hire, um, you'll see a lot of interesting stuff up there. And as a final note uh, to all the technologists, the engineers out there who are interested in building for the public good, go to the website. We've got JDs up. Uh, we are hiring. So with that, thanks. I hope you have a great day.